Thank you, Anna, for the introduction. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to present an extension of my previous work in learning robot controllers from data using sample efficient methods. So, the idea here is to, what we're going to present is how to incorporate the controller structure directly into the learning method in order to speed up the learning and in that way save the robot experiments. So, let's first start considering a uh, general nonlinear system as case X, control input U. And personality. And we want to design optimal feedback controllers for the system. And this is typically, um, it's typically good to have a model of the system. However, when it comes to a real robot or a complex system like a real robot, a humanoid robot, um, it's uh, difficult to come up with models um, that model properly the system. So, um, very often the case is that we have only a linearized version of the system and then we have to, uh, we have to live with it. So, um, a way to penalize the system behavior is to use a quadratic cost that penalizes the system trajectories, uh, state trajectories in the control input uh, over an infinite time horizon. So now, if this is the case, then we can, in the next number of steps, to um, try to design a controller that minimizes this cost. So if the real system behaves truly linear following my model, then uh, the optimal cost will be uh, the solution to the LPR problem. However, since the robot is already nonlinear, then the LPR solution is going to be suboptimal. So what we propose here is to parameterize this controller using a set of parameters theta, and we propose to tune these parameters directly on the robot, uh, observing the data. So that would mean to do a close loop experiment for each set of parameters theta uh, on the robot, wait for the experiment to finish, and then look at the cost, and if we are not happy with the cost, then we can, we should iterate. So, in some sense, this is equivalent to just collecting low cost function values. As controller designers, we might stop prematurely thinking that we have found our minimum, but actually the global minimum could be somewhere else. So, manually tuning controllers has the risk that we can uh, miss interesting regions in our domain. In addition to this, we have a complex robot, like for example, this human robot. Um, and we can have more than 40 states. Uh, and then in this case, the number of parameters that we may improve uh, with might be very, very large. So it's tedious and it takes a lot of time to tune these parameters. In addition to this, uh, uh, for whatever parameter we try on the system, we need uh, for the robot to wait this, uh, we need to wait for the robot to finish this experiment before we can even look at the data. So manually tuning controllers for such complex systems can be <coughs> very tedious. So what we propose here is to learn these parameters from data, and more importantly, we want to be as sample efficient as possible. So we want to exploit the data that we collect from each experiment um, in order to save real robot experiments. And for this, we want to use Bayesian optimization. So Bayesian optimization is very cool because it allows us to model the underlying cost function that we don't know using a probabilistic model. We're going to talk about Gaussian processes. So a Gaussian process is a probability distribution over, this, over the space of functions. It can be from whatever to that. Uh, and here, these white lines are like samples of my Gaussian process, or possible <coughs> functions that are living within, within this Gaussian process. So um, another interesting feature of Gaussian processes is that it gives me the um, expected value of the cost function that I want to learn. And it also gives me some uncertainty bounds with high probability. So I know with high probability that my functions are living here. If we observe one data point, because the Gaussian process is a global model, uh, this data point is informing me uh, in the uh, vicinity uh, about what is happening with the, um, with the mean function. And also, uh, we can see that the uncertainty gets reduced around, around this point. So if we keep collecting data points, at some point, after not so many, we can arrive to a very good estimate of the global minimum of the, of the true function by relying on this probabilistic model. Uh, we have tried Bayesian optimization to tune the controllers, uh, the parameters of the LQR controller of a human robot balancing an inverted pole. So in this case, this was a two-dimensional uh, Gaussian process. And when we run our Bayesian optimization method, we show that uh, this method selects the blue dots, which are like the, the, the locations um, which are smart, smartly selected um, as to be the most informative locations to find the global meaning. At each iteration, we compute an estimate of the global mean, which would be this green dot. And after 20 iterations, we see that uh, the control that we learned is 
much better than the, than the one that we had at the beginning. Bayesian optimization has been successfully applied uh, in the past years for other ro robot applications. And we, we, we all, what I want to stress here is that uh, in all these applications, the Gaussian process was completely unaware of the type of controller that we were using. So what I'm going to present here is how to incorporate the controller structure into the Gaussian process in order to learn faster um, the optimal controller. So let me go back to the Gaussian process regression example that we had before. So um, a Gaussian process is composed by two key elements, the mean function and the kernel. The mean function is, as we said before, the expected value of this cost function that we don't know. This will be this, this thin red line. And the kernel is uh, a key object in this Gaussian process because it, it expresses the covariance or the correlation between uh, two function values at two different locations. Moreover, the kernel expresses the type of functions that we can learn with this Gaussian process. So for example, if we know that our data is smooth, then we want to use kernels that encode the smooth functions. If we know that our data uh, can have steep changes, then we want to use kernels that admit uh, sharp functions or, or functions that admit uh, at most one or two derivatives. If we know that our data is changing <coughs> rapidly, then we want to use kernels that encode rapidly changing functions. So now we can ask, ask the question, what is the kernel that better describes my data? And the thing is, um, this is a very uh, difficult to answer question uh, when it comes, sorry, when it comes to oops, when it comes to uh, real robot uh, controllers, and the reason for that is that uh, okay, yes. So the reason for that is that um, well, um, when it comes to real robot controllers. Um, we don't know a priori which is the data that we are going to observe. And precisely, this is what we want to minimize. We want to minimize the um, experiments that we do on the system. So therefore, data is scarce. So defining the kernel a priori before observing any data is very difficult. So then, what we came up with is that, uh, in some sense, the controller that we use in our system determines the data that we observe. So by incorporating the controller structure directly, <coughs> yes, yeah. By incorporating the controller structure directly in um, in the kernel, we can uh, we can we can learn faster this data. We can predict really better this data. So since we were talking about using uh, LPR controllers, I'm going to describe next time how to how to compute or how to design LPR kernels. So the goal is to um, incorporate the LPR controller into the structure of the kernel. So for this, we are going to assume that we have a scalar linear system. Uh, we, we do this as a first step to approach this problem. And I'm going to introduce um, a parametric LPR kernel <coughs> and a parametric LPR kernel, and then I'm going to show them uh, some simulation results. Um, so let's start with the parametric LPR kernel. So let's consider that we have a scalar linear time invariant system with parameters a hat and b hat that are unknown to us. However, we assume that we have a model available which is good enough. We assume that we can control this model with this state feedback controller, and we have a way to penalize the state's uh, deviation from the references using a parity cost. Then, uh, if this uh, controller um, um, stabilizes my, my system, then we are going to arrive to a stochastic, uh, to a, um, sorry, to a, um, a stationary process, and it is very easy to show that by solving the Dalton equation, we can have a closed form solution for the quadratic cost function uh, um, where the input is the controller. So, in some sense, evaluating this function would be equivalent uh, to do a closed loop experiment on the red system that is connected with the first part of the problem. So, uh, this would be the shape of a cost function. And as we see, this is just a deterministic cost function. However, in order to um, construct um, a kernel, or in order to approach the learning problem, we need, um, we need to come up with some stochastic formulation of this cost. So for this, we can do something very simple, which is considering this function as a feature, and we can multiply this feature by a weight uh, that forms a Gaussian distribution, which is centered in zero. 
If we do this, then it is easy to show that the expected value of this LPR cost function is zero, and that the covariance between two different uh, LPR cost points uh, is nothing else but just the multiplication of these features. So with this, we arrive to the expression of the parametric LPR kernel. And we call it parametric because it depends on the model P and B. So now we're going to show how this kernel compares with other uh, standard standard kernels. So um, if we consider this true system, um, we compare or we uh, do Gaussian pressure regression using a standard kernel. For example, this, this is the square exponential kernel, which is a very widely used kernel, and we see that. Uh, the true function, which is this dashed line, is not very well captured by the mean of the Gaussian process after four points. However, we show that with our parametric LPR kernel, the cost function is very well captured. Nonetheless, it's not very surprising because we have constructed this LPR kernel using parameters A and B, which correspond exactly with the one from the real system. Now, the thing is that what if the of what if the parameters that we use to construct this kernel are a little bit off. So if they are a little bit off, then we see that the kernel fails to, to fit this function. So what, what can we do to solve this? Um, what we came up with is a non-parametric LPR kernel that we can derive in order to address this problem. So similarly as before, uh, we have the same uh, unknown system. And now we assume that we have a, a linear model in which we allow some parametric uncertainty for A and B. So if we do this, uh, the stochastic cost, which before was dependent on only one feature, and now can be extended for multiple features. So the more features we include in our cost, uh, the more expressive our cost is going to be. So if we include N features, then we, can, uh, then we arrive to an expression of the parametric curve kernel that is N times more expressive, let's say. Because each one of these features contains a model that is sampled from these uncertainty ranges. Now the thing is that why not using an infinite number of features? Well, the more features we use, the more heavy comes the computation of this kernel. However, in order to address this problem, we use something that is called the kernel trick. And uh, this is uh, a trick that is used to make the limit of uh, the parametric kernel when, uh, when the, we use infinite features uh, converge to an integral. So the idea is to propose this variance of the, of the weights to be a diagonal matrix where the elements are inversely proportional to the number of features. So if we do that, we can ensure that this limit is going to convert to an integral so we can solve it in time. So this is what we call the non-parametric LKR kernel. And if we use this kernel for the previous example, then we see that as, uh, as long as the real system parameters are contained within my uncertainty ranges, then the non-parametric LPR kernel is going to fit the data very well. Um, so now I'm going to show some results. I mean, these are just some of them, but there are many more in the paper. So um, we, we want to show the fitting performance of the LPR kernel versus the square exponential kernel. And we see that um, for 10 simulations and only two data points, the square exponential kernel doesn't do very well in the, in the root mean square error of the the quadratic cost function and the, and the mean estimate, while the parametric kernels uh, do a fairly good job. In addition to this, since we were interested in Bayesian optimization, we also have run uh, a statistical comparison of 10 runs and allowing only two evaluations. So after two evaluations, the Bayesian optimization method has to tell me what, what is the location of the global minimum. And then we compute the regret, which is uh, the difference between the location of the global minimum, the, the true minimum, and the one that we estimate. And we see the square exponent has a hard time trying to find it, while the other ones are doing very well. Um, finally, uh, I started this talk saying that in general we have a nonlinear system we can linearize. So um, this method can, all, can also be used when we have a nonlinear system uh, and we have a model that we, that we use to linearize the dynamics around the new point with some parametric uncertainty. So in that case, we can propose the cost function, we can propose the, 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 the cost to be explained by the LPR cost plus a bias term. And this bias is supposed to capture the difference between my model and the nonlinear non system. So if we do that, we can still propose a Gaussian process uh, with zero mean, and in which the kernel is the addition of two kernels. 
kernel would be the healthier kernel that we, that we, that we talked about. And if we can capture the non-linearities using a standard kernel, like for example, in this case, of square point. So, uh, in conclusion, we have uh, proposed a parametric <coughs> kernel, a non-parametric healthier kernel, and the take-home message of this project is that uh, if our problem is about um, controlling a system using an LQR controller, then using these LQR kernels really helps you to feed the data better in comparison with the standard, the standard kernels. Um, and in future work, we wanna, we're, we're already working on extension of this uh, kernel for a vector system, this was a scalar case. And it's actually surprisingly easy to compute the parametric kernel for the vector case. Um, and we also want to do some real experiments to show that this is actually something that you can use in reality. So, thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Estimating the parameters from data, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is, uh, I didn't talk about this, but this is something that we have uh, here. So um, we, have also, we have also done this. Um, and this, so you know, the, the parametric kernel depends on your, on your um, parameters A and B, so you can just estimate them from data. And this is actually an interesting connection uh, with system identification. So in some sense, learning the hyperparameters of my kernel here would be similar to do system identification. So it's an interesting connection between machine learning and control. Uh, so the answer is yes, we have done this, and this kernel usually performs <coughs> pretty, pretty well. So if you can infer the, the parameters from data, um, you, should, you, should, I mean, you should do it. The only problem is that when it comes to uh, learning uh, this kind of road, this kind of LQR controllers from data, um, you typically cannot afford many samples. Therefore, uh, you know, like you can learn from data, but not from many samples. So um, it's not so clear uh, like how well you can do this if you have like much more many dimensions. Are there other questions? Yes. Um, so how do you learn your function? Do you, are you using an online Gaussian approach or? No, no. This is this is all offline learning. So you. So how do you get your training data? Uh, yeah. So so um, so in, I mean, in this case, it was all simulations. Uh, so you can just run a close-up simulation and truncate it uh, up to some uh, time horizon, and then you can assume that your evaluation is noisy with respect to the real one. You know, like like uh, all that I have shown here uh, assumes that you have an infinite time horizon. But you cannot do this in reality, so you have to truncate it at some point. Then you stop whenever you think that your time is long enough, and then you assume that this evaluation is noisy. And this is the way that you used to learn your cost function. So in the previous work that I, that I showed, we, we have done this for real robots by assuming, for example, a one-minute experiment. So you want to tune the controller of a, of a, to make a robot balance and vertical, pole, for example, and then you cannot just stop very early, because then you will basically eat all the tension. So uh, you have to, for example, stop after one minute, and after one minute you say, okay, this is my data, I get my cost, and this is the way you run the cost function. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, then let's take the speaker one more time.